So I don't think we really need to introduce our first speaker, but I'm going to do it anyway. Man, Jason, how long have I known you? Uh, over 10 years. Yeah, sure, easily. Yeah, easily over 10 years. Uh, first time I met Jason, you know how he does awkward hugs? Oh, yeah. yeah. He did a handstand and hugged me that way. Right yeah, that, we're, we're, that's awkward to a different level. And that's, you liked it. Okay, I wasn't going to say that part. It was a little fun. But... Um, yes, I'm back. He drinks the most Diet Pepsi out of anybody on the planet Earth. If he cut me, I fizz. He, <laughs> he awkwardly hugs everyone in the universe. Ball of positivity. Just a wonderful guy. Help me in welcoming Jason Street. Hello, everyone. Oops, where you go? Okay, so. Uh, this is my legal disclaimer. I always like to start off with a legal disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer, though I've played one on the internet successfully before. Uh, so when I talk about certain things and it says, well, why would you do that? You're evil. That's bad. It's like, well, yeah. It's like, remember the kittens. I'm adorable. It's like, I will not try to steal from you, kill you, or ruin you financially unless you pay me first. There's always a contract. I don't do this stuff for free. So, uh, so remember when you get to that section, just remember that. And I know we're at DEF CON, so that means probably one-third of you are, are feds. Uh, and I do a lot of Fed bashing in here, but it's not because I don't like the feds. It's just they give so many great examples of bad security. How could I not use them? Uh, and that's not my fault. So sorry, hashtag sorry, not sorry. Uh, so let's get going into it. I'm on another list, I'm sure. Uh, so here it goes. Tell the talk is I pwn the, I pwn the not. It's quite simply the th top three things that I really love my uh, victims, uh, target uh, clients to do. <laughs> Uh, that I love for them to do that because it makes it easier for me to rob them. And the top three things that I hate for them to do because, well, it makes it harder for me to rob them. So, uh, and then a little bit of uh, advanced, uh, some training and stuff that you can go and take back to your office. It's like, I, want, I, I don't do those talks where it's like, you know, it's like, here's just how it's broken. I like to help fix things too. Uh, my bio slide, this is like, if you want to go check me out on Twitter or you want to go visit my website, uh, I do things, I hack things, and that's an actual picture that someone put up in their sock uh, to warn them against me. And I told them, I said, congratulations, you've effectively stopped me uh, and no one else. Uh, but I, I'm not going to be breaking into your building anytime soon. Congratulations. Um, and especially at DEF CON, you, you've seen a lot of really good technical talks. There's a lot of good hacking talks. There's a lot of good content here. Uh, and this is a good example of one of our problems uh, with red teaming. It's like, I'm not a red teamer. It's like, so I'm going to make fun of them a little bit. Um, they get in and when they get hired by a client, they go in and they're talking about how they're ninjas. It's like, they're, I'm coming in and I'm like, I'm breaking in. I'm going through the door. I'm going through the skylight. It's like, I'm punching people in faces and seeing their plans. It's like all these different things that they're doing, you know, everything short of, you know, putting on my robe and wizard hat. It's like all these different kind of attack vectors. And when they get done, they write this report and the, uh, their clients are like, thank goodness, we're okay. They're like, no, look at all the stuff I broke. No, no, you guys are like ninjas. Y'all did so much. I mean, of course we couldn't withstand that. Of course we couldn't do all that. So we're protected because it's like, we don't have to worry about those kind of attack vectors. It's like, so that's the upper left-hand corner. They're like, that's where everybody thinks is going on. And so what I try to do to my clients, I do security awareness engagements. I'm trying to teach them to be more security aware. I'm not trying to, to break something. I'm trying to help build something. So uh, one of the things that I do is like, I tell them, like, look, I'm going to spend less than two hours on Google. And uh, I'm not using Maltigo. I'm not using any other tool, Recon NG, none of that. I'm going to use two hours on Google, and I'm going to see what I can get. And then I'm going to walk into your, your building for the first time and see what I can walk into. And I've stolen computers that way from behind teller lines in banks. So uh, it's effective. And what's even more effective is then when you go to the client and you tell them, it's like, Here's the report, and like, oh, wow, that's wizard. No, no, I had a, a, a shirt that said hacker on it, and they still let me in your server room. There's a problem you got to address. And it's like, well, but, yeah, but you got all this research. It's like, no, that was, you know, 30 minutes on uh, Google with, and Facebook on your employee's uh, Twitter profile, and I was playing World of Warcraft at the same time. It's like, still haven't done Mechanon, so don't give me any spoilers. Uh, so it's like, so I was like, I, that's what I tell them. It's like, so they don't have an excuse. There's no excuse for that. 
they have to take it seriously because they realize if, I mean, I tell people social engineering is so easy, even I can do it. It's like, and if I'm your common denominator, if I'm your threat model, you've got problems that you need to address. And that's what we need to show, start telling our uh, clients and start telling our employers. It's like, not trying to show them how elite we are, but tell them how bad the problem is and why it needs to get fixed. So, and the other issue, especially when it comes to our employers and, and companies, you look at the left, and that's what your CEO expects. We need the fortress. You know, it's like we need to build those. We need big, we need firewalls. We need bigger firewalls. We need, they need to be huge. Uh, China's APT is going to pay for it. It's like that, that's what's going to happen, right? It's like, and then you go to them for a budget, and what happens? Well, we'll give you that to the right. It's like that's how much fun that you're going to have. I'm sure you'll make it work. You know, standards to go loan, take this, and, and you're good, uh, which is a problem as well. So we have to start balancing the budget. It's like what happens it's like when we don't have enough resources, but we're still expected to secure everything. So that's another conundrum that we're facing. And once again, I say one of the biggest solutions on that is always going to be your users. It's always going to be the people. So let's get more into this is actually one of my offensive talks, but I do get a little ranty. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so one of the first things that I love, I love when I come into a company, employees not empowered or educated to question the unusual. That's amazing. It's like people that, I mean, and we're talking good employees. We're talking people that are smart. They know what they're doing. They're, they know how to do their job. But no one's ever told them that part of their job was security. So therefore, they didn't have to worry about that part. They're inside a secured building. The only thing worse than no security is a false sense of security. Because when you get past that guard with the badge reader, you get past this elevator lobby, it's like, well, you're safe. Whew. Good. Except for I go usually through the freight elevator and I'm inside your building and now you're not so safe, but you still think you are. And um, one, this leads to one of the uh, engagements I was on at the beginning of this year. And it was a, uh, it was a, uh, a location. It was like an undisclosed location because they're probably still upset with me maybe. Uh, and I went in. And I had uh, one of the USB Ninja cables. It's like uh, just got the cool MG cable. I have I'm not seen that one yet, the OMG cable. I can't wait to play with that one. But I got the, uh, the USB Ninja cable, and it's a lightning cable. It looks like a lightning charger cable, and you can plug it into a machine. You don't even have to have your phone attached to it, but you can charge your iPhone, too, if you like it. Uh, and it comes with a detonator. Uh, it's not called a detonator, but I like to call it that way because it makes me sound cooler. And, um, and, and you've got two different payloads by two different buttons. So I literally walk up to people in this one section. There's like eight of them sitting in this like open office thing because we all love those. And I went up to them and I said, excuse me, I'm doing a USB rights check. It's like we're making sure our domain policy it doesn't allow you to actually charge your devices on, our, on your computers because you have certain outlets for that that you're supposed to be using. So I just need to do that check real quick. And so I plug the cable into their uh, computer. There's no phone attached to it. It's just a cable. I plug it in. And I could, you know, I could then walk away or, or I could do something like that and do it all discreetly or like reach into my pocket and, and, and push the button and see what happens. Oh, no. I pull the detonator out. It's got a little box with an antenna. And I'm like, I go, boop. It, it doesn't really go boop, but it sounds cool when you say boop. It's like, so, uh, boop. And all of a sudden, notepad pops up on their screen. It auto-magically types out, to uh, test completed successfully, thank you for your cooperation, smiley emoji. <laughs> little odd, don't you think? A little odd, it's like, you know, some guy plugs in a cable and your notepad's typing on it like it's possessed. It's like, I mean, may, these people must have dealt with ghosts in the before because not one person out of eight questioned that. One person, not one person out of eight questioned a cable being plugged in and a payload deploying. That's a problem. That is not cool. It's like, I mean, and I was looking sketchy. I mean, I was like, I was dressed, uh, it was one of the scariest things I can do as a business person. They should have, they should have realized something. And so that's a problem. We need to educate our users. We need to let them know that that's part of their responsibility. Now, one of the things I hate uh, not the CIA, I'm sorry guys that are in here, no, uh, is uh, open, uh, open lobbies, very secured and very wide, you know, uh, clean lobbies, because it's hard for me to loiter. It's like, I don't know if that's really what the CIA lobby looks like. Can anybody tell me what it looks like? Just checking. 
Okay. So it's like, so, I mean, because I tell people, like, the only way I'm going to get to CIA headquarters is come in through the back door with a bag over my head. So it's like, so I don't, I don't know if I'm ever going to actually see what that front lobby looks like. But, uh, but yeah, it's like those open spaces are, are horrible for an attacker because where can I loiter to check out what the, the traffic patterns are like? It's like, how can I get reconnaissance? How can I actually uh, try to do uh, any kind of Wi-Fi attack or RFID attack? So this reminds me of another story. It's like I was in um, Moscow, uh, Russia, November, in November, uh, going to a couple of hacker conferences. And I was at the one in Moscow, and like some friends knew I was uh, uh, in town. And uh, so I'm already on a list right now. Someone's already like, is he on that list? He's like, yes, I am. Trust me. I'm on already. Any list that any Fed is thinking about putting me on, I'm already there. Don't waste your time. So, um, so I go there, and I was like, and some friends from Kaspersky, was telling me, say, hey, you want to come down and tour the, the headquarters? And I'm like, I'm friends with Eugene. I mean, and I'm not joking. I really am friends with Eugene. It's like Metal Meta Conference. He was an awesome guy, really funny. It's like, I said, yeah, I want to show up and uh, check out and see what the place looks like. So I get in there, and I mean, I'm looking sketchy. AF. I mean, I've got, I got my hoodie on. It's like, I got my jacket. It's freaking cold in Moscow in November, FYI. And so I get in there, and I got my bag, and there's this lobby, and it's got some really cool open lobby. And there's like two guards on either side of the reception desk area, but one's like really attentive, like right there by the where the, the employees go to badge in. And there's also this really cool elephant Dolly uh, statue, you know, Salvador Dolly statue, which is you should go check out on, on the internet. It's cool. Um, and I, there's these long leather couches. And I'm like, awesome. And I can't help being bad. It's like I'm not trying to rob them. But I always like to check to see what security's like and how it works. It's just one of those things that I do. I don't ever go anywhere with it, but it's like cool to figure out. It's like, what, where's the cameras? What's going on? So as literally, as soon as I get in there, I'm not going to the desk, to, the receptionist to log in. I just want to go and check to see what kind of security was like. I found out very quickly before my butt touched leather, Ivan, I don't know if his name's Ivan, but he looked like an Ivan, okay? This guy was like huge. It's like he was like, his shirt was like two times too small or muscles four times too big. I don't know which. It's like Ivan starts walking over to me and he goes like, comrade, can I help you uh, get to the reception? So are you meeting someone? And I mean, I don't know how to do a Russian accent, so I'm just, but, but I was like, and uh, I mean, when you're that big, you don't have to be rude. He was very polite, very friendly, and it's like, just don't break me in half, please, you know? And so I was like, so, but I will tell you this right now. As soon as he said that, it's like, oh, yes, I, I'm supposed to be here. Let's go and do the, whatever you need me to do right now. And that was perfect. That's what it's supposed to be. You're supposed to have your security that engage. They're not supposed to just be looking at a screen. They're not just supposed to be. So I uh, went into this building one time, and my uh, badge, my visitor badge, was printed on regular paper. And I just walked by and nodded to security. Hey, what's going on? And they opened the door. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's like you've got to make sure they're questioning, make sure they're looking uh, for the proper IDs, make sure that they're paying attention of what the lobby looks like, what kind of foot traffic is going on. You don't want someone, you want someone like Ivan. You don't want someone like me going around. It's like uh, getting into your buildings. So... Once again, you know, you can't talk about uh, bad security without mentioning the TSA even once. Uh, and sorry uh, for any TSA. No, I'm joking. TSA is not in here. Uh, it's like you got to take security seriously for that. Uh, so one of the biggest problems is no egress filtering or internal monitoring. One of the things, that, one of the payloads that I have on my Bash Bunny, it's like, thank you, Hack5. It's like, no plug. But it's like one of the uh, payloads that I have is I plug it in. And it telnets to tau.blinkylights.nl. It's a wonderful payload because what you, happens in your command prompt, it runs ASCII Star Wars, which is amazing. Not so amazing is why in, Bob, why in the world is Bob in accounting able to telnet to the Netherlands without anybody wondering why that's going on? That's a problem. Why do we have this egress filtering problem? How can you lose 1.83 terabytes of data from your network, Sony, and not have someone think about what's going on here? I mean, the networking department should have at least said, hey, do we need to increase the bandwidth? You know, it's like, it's like <laughs> I, I, I mean, someone should have noticed something. You're, 
one terabyte data should not go to Paraguay. It's like, and not have someone question, is all I'm saying. No offense to the Paraguayans. Uh, so, so that's one of the things we have to do. We have to do proper egress filtering. People go and say, they keep assuming and they keep with this idea that our internal networks are safe. I'm sorry, the attack is coming from within the house, okay? That's where it's at. Do not let just blind egress filtering. It's like, make sure you're monitoring. Make sure you tell what ports are allowed for all your users to connect outbound. Because who's actually going in and just like trying to like uh, connect and just break it right into to the firewall, right through the, no, you're sending an email. You're sending a, a, a malicious link. The connector, uh, the, the user does all the work for you. They run the payload. Now you have them calling back to your, connect, uh, your command and control center with a secured connection, and they're established inside your network. It was they started it. So they didn't start the fire, but it was the other guy. But it's like still, it's bad. I'm full of these guys. I'm sorry. Uh, so you have to make sure that you're monitoring your internal network because if you're not, don't worry. Eventually, I will be. And, and that's not something you really want. So one of the things that I hate, though, and I mean I hate with a passion, dual factor authentication. What a bummer, OK? I go through, I mean, I buy all the cool Proxmarts. I got the Boss Cloner. I got all these really cool RFID cloning tools. Even got one of the key fobs that don't do nothing, but it looks like really cool when it lights up and people think you're serious. Uh, it's like I got all those tools. And it's like, and then I get to a door, and boom, there's a keypad. I'm like, oh, well, this was unexpected. Uh, I guess I'll just wander around, act like I'm on the phone until someone can let me in. Um, and so you have to have dual-factor authentication. You have to have multi-factor. So, and, and also, trust me, when you're having, you can't just say you have dual-factor authentication, have RFID badge reader, and then a keypad that has been so worn down with the number two and a four and a one and a three and go, we're secure. I wonder what that passcode is. It's like, you know, what could that be? It's like you have to make sure that you're, uh, you're changing the keypads. You got to make sure that you're using the right. I mean, it doesn't have to be that cool in a say, diehard Bruce Willis stuff, you know, where it's like the, the changing the combinations and you need to know the algorithms. That would be cool if you could do that. But uh, it doesn't have to be that. Just something that doesn't so people can guess what the next passcode is going to be. Uh, and another thing about uh, dual factor authentication, it's like by going in and seeing a company, it's like I saw just recently, uh, it was one of the clients that, that made some mistakes, but they also did something really amazing. They segmented their office building. It's like it was in this big high-rise office building, but you could not get to the other section of the same suite without using a badge. And I had snuck in through the uh, freight elevator. So I'm like, I get there and I get to the door and I'm going, oh, I'm going to back up. I'm not going that way. I go over here. It's like, oh, maybe, okay. I'm just going to go to the break room and try to reorganize. And so, I mean, because that will stop intruders. It's about delaying the attacks. I mean, I eventually stole a, a woman's badge who, was, uh, who left it on the desk and everything. It's, but, but still, it took time. And that's what you want. You want to be able to stall attackers' time. It's like, how many people here have a fireproof safe that is just always fireproof? No one. They're fireproof up to three hours. They're fireproof up to six hours. They're fireproof up to 12 hours. It's like the more money you spend, the more your uh, uh, safe can withstand a fire. Explain that to your executives. The more money they spend, the longer you can withstand an attack before it gets detected, before it gets responded to. That's what you're looking at. You're not trying to stop the risk. You're trying to mitigate as much as you can. So that would slow me down. That attack, that has slowed me down. That whole attack surface by being segmented, it's like, it, that was an opportunity moment. It's like, I didn't plan for that. I mean, look at me. I don't adult very well. I don't plan for much, okay? I mean, I just YOLO'd it, and then I was stuck. If I wasn't just lucky enough to have an uneducated employee on their security awareness, it's like having that badge there, I would have still been unsuccessful. It's like, uh, or, I, or the other attack that you do is you just wait with your phone. Everybody done that? You know, you wait with your phone like you're, you're talking to someone. So, yeah, what's going on? You know, oh, yeah, pretty good. And then when someone opens up the door, you don't even acknowledge. You just walk right through like you're supposed to be there. That works very effective. It's like, you know, you shouldn't let that happen. But we have to have 
multi-factor authentications. You have to have the, that segment. There's got to be steps. It can't just be, I open the door, I own everything. That's not going to work out well for you. You're going to have a bad day. Now, another thing that I see a lot of is everybody that's got procedures. We all got policies and procedures. But how many people use them? And once again, another great example. It's like, uh, thank you, U.S. government, Air Force. Uh, two civilians somehow breached an Air Force base and were found only when one of them told the airmen she had been kidnapped. Right here in Nevada. Congratulations. Sorry. Uh, but um, it's like, what kind of problem do you have with your base security on an Air Force base that the guard didn't notice Oh, there's a guy driving in with no, in a regular, like a Honda Civic, and very fast, and very looks frustrated, and there's a woman, like, you know, up on the glass. It's like, ah, it's okay. It's, okay. it's like, you know, that's a problem. A lot of procedures failed on that, do you think? I think there was a lot of procedures that failed. And this is not the first time that something like this has really badly happened uh, in, on Air Force bases. One of my favorite stories was during the height of the Cold War, a Russian agent went into Germany on an Air Force base in, in Germany, and <laughs> he walked in, took a, uh, went to the uh, tarmac, got into, uh, went to a, one of the jet fighters, detached a missile from the plane, then he wheelbarrowed. I don't know. I'm hoping he stole it. They didn't tell me. I, I, I didn't read the history. I don't know if he actually found it there or uh, he brought it with him. But I hope he stole it there. So he took a wheelbarrow, wheelbarrowed the missile back to his car, <laughs> stuck it in the back of his Mercedes Benz. We're in Germany. It's like, and then drove off with it. But before he did, don't worry. It's like he put the red tag on the tip of the missile because German laws are German laws. You don't F with those, okay? <laughs> so he had a, he then drove that home, disassembled the missile, and piece by piece mailed it back to Russia. And they got a very efficient mail system. You got to hand them that, okay? It's like every piece made it. We all have to agree some procedures failed. Some policies were probably not properly enforced. Those are issues. And you can always say, if that can happen to the Air Force, it can happen to anybody. It's like, especially if it's happening to the Air Force, no, no offense to the Air Force. It's like, I'm, I'm, I don't have to worry about top secret clearance, look at me, so it's like, it's all good. So that's one of the things you have to talk about. You need to make sure that it doesn't matter how nice your policies and your procedures are on paper, if they're not being enforced from the top up, you don't have a policy. If your CEO has an exemption on the password reset policy, congratulations, you don't have a security policy. If your executives think that those rules and those security policies don't apply to them, I've got a surprise for you. The people they report to, they think it doesn't matter to them either. And the people that report to them, they don't think it matters either. So by the time you finish, within six months, no one is actually following the policy except for Bob in the mailroom going like, I'm supposed to do this, you know? It's like, there's my stapler, I'm good. You know, it's like, no offense to Bob's or people in the mailroom or accounting. But still, that's what you gotta do. You've gotta make sure that up on high, the, the executives follow the same security policies as everybody else does. That's important. So now, I went through that really quick. Because I want to get to some really good stuff, not just to be funny, okay? Hopefully, I'll, I did get some chuckles, so I was very, very happy about that. It's like, especially after the, the night I had, this is, uh, this is I'm, str I'm stressing myself. Uh, but now we want to get to the serious stuff. Those are some of the things that I did or didn't do to get into a building or break in or rob people. So what can you take back to work and some questions? I have questions for you to tell your employers or ask your employers or ask your users or ask your security team that maybe something needs to be done. It's like some of the things that, some changes that could be made. These are some of the questions that are always uncomfortable. And it's like some questions that you just may give you a fresh look at. And that's what I'm hoping I'm doing is give you a fresh look at it. One thing is, which one fits the bill for insider threats? It's like, sorry FBI guys, but it's like Robert Hansen, he was a malicious insider. He was malicious in his intent, 
and the execution of his compromise. I can tell by some of the faces who the feds are. That's awesome. And it's like, uh, I can read faces too, people. I'm a social engineer. But um, so he was a bad guy. He was a, a really bad guy. But then you've got some genius over at the TSA administration. Sorry. No, not sorry. Uh, who, uh, the TSA administration who allowed in a public publication, publish, how many times can I say pub, uh, published the picture of the TSA keys. Does anybody need a copy of the TSA keys? Because you can 3D print them. Thank you, Johnny Xmas. It's like uh, you can actually print them out. Now, which one was an insider threat? Both. Both are insider threats. We get so focused on looking for attackers, looking for people that are doing something maliciously wrong, we don't realize some people with the best intentions are totally hosing you down. They are totally messing up your, your security system. Um, I had a thought once. There it went. Uh, so uh, I, was, I was talking about more on insider threat. So it's like we're going a little bit further on that, and we'll slide that over to here. This is an insider threat, correct? This is also a problem with policy. This was a story that Joseph uh, Cox uh, released. Uh, I'm going to go all the way here and see if the mic works. Okay. New... Uh, uh, the uh, Custom Border Patrol said the traveler and license plate uh, image data hacked from its contractor was not found on the dark web. Because remember, a contractor took it against their policy, against a contractor's policy, they had the uh, data available on their internal move, uh, network. They moved it to their internal network, then they were compromised. And the contractor was like, Oh, okay, well, I guess we got to report that. We, we, got, we got owned. It's like, uh, but nothing, everything's fine. And, the, and the, of course, the border control was like, you know, Homeland Security was like, we searched the dark web. You're good. <laughs> you know? And I'm sure there was literally, their PR guy was asking their tech guy, what does that mean? Nothing, but it makes it sound really cool when you get owned that you searched the dark web because it's the dark web. Okay? So... That worked out well for them up to about maybe three hours later when a reporter searched the dark web and found over 300 gigs of the data available for download. So what was your insider threat there? Your first one, the employee that went against policy and downloaded the data onto the internal network. Another insider threat was the team that allowed that to happen in that contractor's uh, company. But what else? Homeland Security's response team. They failed. You don't go and try to, you don't try to assure people unless you know facts. It's like, I mean, there's nothing more scarier than, you know, we're, we're, from, the, we're from the government. We're here to help. Don't worry. That's almost as bad as saying, I'm from the internet. I'm here to help you. You know, it's like, it's like that's, that never usually ends well, people. So you got to understand that those were all insider threats. But hardly any of them were malicious. And I got my other story. Remember that one that I was like, when like, and I lost it? It's like, here it is. So we had an executive who worked at a bank branch. And he was a great employee. He was hardworking. He was dedicated. He really, really wanted to do his job. So much, in fact, he calculated how much time he was losing in the conference room and not being able to respond to emails, not being able to see what was going on in the, uh, uh, his emails, uh, getting his emails on his computer or sending things out while he was in a meeting with sales or meeting with other people that he could have been responding at the same time and working and doing di diligent work for his company. That wonderful employee, legit good guy, decided to put a Linksys router underneath the conference table, connect the internal network to the internet port, and voila. Now he can connect and get his emails, everything else. That was wonderful until I was able to connect his access point and get access to everything else. But he was not malicious. He was not trying to do something harmful. So you need to understand not all insider threats come from the bad guy. 
Sometimes it just comes from, and I, I mean this in the, the funny way, but in also the nice way, it just comes from human stupidity. It's like sometimes we just go, duh, I, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And I'm like, you think? You think? Maybe? Yeah, that's a bad thing. So here's another thing that you need to ask. Who do your employees ask for identification from? Especially not that janitor guy. He's a little sketch. I'd definitely ask for him. It's like, but who else? CEOs, executives, the security. Who, who would you ask for identification? All of them. Yes. I even threw a little surprise in there because the, if you look, the security guard's got an actual ID badge. But you look at all of them. My friend Ben Tin just told me this at a party here in Vegas, which is the reason why I love uh, summer camp, is um, he gave me this story to share, and I, I did tell him I wasn't going to give him credit for it, but I just did, so I'm sorry. Um, but he found this one client that what they did was they played a game of Where's Waldo. It was amazing gamification for security awareness for their users. Around the, the, the company, one employee would have a Where's Waldo picture on his ID badge. And he would wear that. And it would be a valid badge for his login, for their login information. And if an employee spotted the Where's Waldo, they got a $100 gift card. Anytime someone spotted Waldo, they got $100. Did people go and say, I'm going to be more security conscious. I want to make sure my company's protected. I want to make sure that my data is protected. I want to make sure there's no strange intruders in my building because there's safety uh, problems. There's privacy concerns. No, they said, I want a hundred bucks. Let me start looking at these name tags. They still are never going to care about your data, but you can make them be concerned about security in other ways by showing them what's in it for them. What are the positive aspects for them? That's one of the things that you have to do. And so that was an amazing thing. I'm totally stealing that, by the way, but, you know, I made it public, so too bad. But yet, that is a wonderful thing to do for your employees. Start a Where Waldo's uh, competition. Here's another one. What does your social media profile really say about you? That's a key question. It's like, I don't run Nmap anymore. Nmap's a great tool. It's like, I don't go and mess with the OSI model. Okay, I mean, I, I, I go with layer eight right off the bat, you know. Please don't make me no, do all number seven, like I said. It's not technical, but it's like, but after all those other layers that are the, the, the really cool layers, you got layer eight, the human layer. I don't have to bypass your firewall if I can bypass your receptionist. It's like if I can find out information from social media, that's what I scan. I don't scan your network. I don't scan your firewalls. I scan Twitter. I uh, scan your about page. I scan those kind of informations because that's the information that I gather that convinces the person to click the link. I had a CEO, and I told this story before, and so I repeat again, sorry. It's like a lot of people have heard my stories before, but uh, one CEO hired me to do a, a pen test. It's like a spear phishing attack. It literally took less than an hour on his about page and Twitter, his Twitter profile, to create the spear fish, and that was all I used to target him. And he was the one that hired me. And he clicked the link within 12 hours of receiving the email. It's like, that's not a testament to what I can do. It's a testament to like how people aren't properly prepared for it. And anybody can be susceptible. It's like, if I tell you that you've won a million dollars, it's like, all you have to do is change your name, you know, wire $3,000 to Western Union to this wonderful person in, in Ghana. It's like, yeah, people are a little bit, people are going like, Maybe not that one, not clicking on that one. But if I tell you that you're, I'm your coworker, that I really enjoyed your going away party last Thursday night, and I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the vacation in Cabo San Lucas, it's like with the family, you know, Josh and, and Trish and, and, and Brian, it's like, well, you're gonna click on that link that I provided in there. Or the pictures that I took from your going away party. Are you going to click on those links? Possibly. Because we're not telling them to be cautious of those things. We're not telling them to be curious about, well, why would they send it to me like this? And they're saying that their email is coming from this address. It's like the, my internal email address. But it's re responding to something else because I hovered over the link. 
because all your employees hover over the links of the, the, the front page, right? Good, you're not liars. That's awesome. So, yeah, so you got to watch those things. you got to teach your employees to be more suspicious and be careful what they post. It's like I live tweet my life. It's like I'm just trying to make other nation states happier and, and, and use less resources tracking me. But still, a lot of people live tweet their life. It's like, but you got to do it responsibly. You got to do it obfuscation. Most of the time that I tweet somewhere, it's like something that's cool. I'm already gone. You know, obsec by delay. It's like some people don't have that option. Some people are just broadcasting right out there. I saw a bank on their Facebook page at their barbecue showing everybody what their badges look like. And if you want to see why InfoSec drinks, go do a search on Instagram for hashtag new job, hashtag new badge. That will make you cry. Okay? It is sad. It's like have a bottle of, you know, whiskey. I don't drink alcohol. I don't know. It's like one of those big bottles of alcohol that's really strong. It's like probably vodka, right? So it's like have them have that. It's like when you start looking at those things. Now, another thing is, Fishing is one of the leading causes of compromise, but do your employees really take it seriously? We're talking about zero days still, people. Everybody like bringing their burner phone to DEF CON because I'm worried about the zero day that's, that the nation state's going to attack me with. Yeah, that'll happen. Keep, keep waiting. It's like everybody's worried about these zero days, and I can still, and I have friends that still find MSOA 67 on their network. That's 11 years old. That's a 5,327th day. Why are we worried about those? It's like you only worry about, you know, it's like that, uh, that bad meme with the, 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 the one girl and the guy and the other girl. It's like, you know, everybody's looking at that zero day, and here's the Missouri, what about me? It's like, oh, no, no, there's a zero day. As soon as you get to two days, too old, we're done. It's like I'm sure uh, IT compliance will take care of it. That's a problem. So you got to understand that phishing is one of your severe problems because that's attacking human nature. And one of the biggest things that I use to attack companies and organizations is human nature. A false sense of security, like it's never going to happen to me, and curiosity and gentleness. It's like, oh, I want to be kind. I want to be helpful. I'm an employee. I'm supposed to help. Okay. One of the best ones, though, is it's never going to happen to me. You want to see something depressing? Go to the uh, news search feature and search just for the sentence, it was a quiet neighborhood. There are some grisly things happening in quiet neighborhoods, people. Murders and deaths. People going up to the neighbors and going like, I didn't know about the hidden basement. It's like he seemed like a really nice guy. It's like, it's like those are really, I want to live in a really loud urban area because those seem like a lot safer to me. It's like those quiet neighborhoods are like really sketchy. So it's like, that's because we don't, we never expect it to happen to us. It's always a quiet neighborhood until it's not. It's always someone else that got compromised until it's not. It's always someone else that clicked on the link until it's not. Except for Bob County, he clicks on all the links. We knew what's going to happen eventually. Okay, so you have to watch out for those things. Test those things. And we talk about testing things. What about do you let your security systems make sure they are operating as intended? Because here's another mistake by the NSA where they improperly over-collected over call data records for a second time last year. Documents show renewing privacy concerns about the surveillance program due to expire in December. I love that. Have you ever noticed that the NSA and Facebook, almost the same, have never accidentally given you a notification like, oh, by the way, we're doing some changing settings and we accidentally made your profile a little bit more secure. We accidentally locked you down to private. We accidentally made sure that your uh, account saves. No. When it's that mistake, it's like, woohoo, wide open. Sorry about that, Instagram. It's like everybody can see everything. How did that happen? Our marketers thank us, but it's like you may not. So you have to test those. You, who has a firewall and has sent malicious packets to it? Who has an IDS system that sent something besides an e-car to it? Who's got an IPS system to see it's working? Who's, got, who's actually testing their uh, methodology? Who's activating ransomware? Not in your environment. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to get crazy. I know it's DEF CON, okay? I'm not going to get crazy. But who puts it on a segmented network and then runs it on their endpoint solution to see if it actually stops the ransomware? 
It actually stops the compromise. Are you testing those devices? And I don't mean having the sales engineer come in, show you all the bells and whistles, all the flips and the flops, and it's like, there you go. Look how protected you are. We discovered all these different things. It's like, oh, you're lucky you came to us in time. We're done. Uh, I'll see you later in about three months. It's like, I don't, but you were contacting me every day for a year. Well, I know, but we're good now. It's like you're, you're secure. So you've got to test those products. You can't just assume they're going to be done by default. So anybody who ever put a snort installation into their network realizes you never leave it at the default. It's like you're going to have a bad day. And one of the last things I want to talk about is what metrics do you, uh, do you have that helps to justify your budget and your actions? Because guess what? I, I got some bad news for you. It's like the better you are, the less you're seen. There's nothing more comforting than going into a management budget meeting at the end of the year and telling your CFO, hey, you notice how you didn't really notice anything going on in the company this year? If you give us $2 million more next year, we'll make sure you see nothing going on next year. Sounds like a mob hitman, right? It's like, it's like, it's like hey, hey, got a nice network. hate to see something happen to it. You know, it's like, uh, so you give, me a, give me a little bit more on the VIG. It's like, I, I can make this work. That's a problem. We have to show them something. We have to show them numbers. We have to show them metrics, and you have them, and you're not using them. you got to create these charts. You've got to create numbers. I mean, everybody loves pie. It's like, give them pie charts. It's like, make them get these metrics. How many uh, quarantined emails did you get from your email gateway? How many viruses were detected in your network? How many firewall alerts did you get? How many IPS rules went out? How many uh, actions that you had to investigate? Those are all numbers. And when you want to get really scary, you start looking at your internal networks, like how many servers do you have patched currently? How many uh, servers, how many workstations do you have patched separately? How quickly do the dats come out for your uh, antivirus network? How quickly do they get rolled out? Uh, how quickly do the uh, Microsoft patches, you know, it's, uh, it's patch Tuesday, so that means it's uh, reverse Wednesday, Metasploit Monday. It's like, that's how that works, right? <laughs> it's like, so do you have those things out? And if it's Java, you're, you're just doing it every other day. But still, get those alerts, get those numbers. Put those out there, because your executives are not going to understand that per se, but it's tangible. It shows them numbers. It shows that you're doing something, Okay. Because when they go by your cubes and they see, you know, the Game of Thrones action figures and the Nerf guns, sometimes they may question themselves. It's like, why do we have these guys here after all? You know, it's like you've got to show them results. You've got to show them that you're doing something and they're getting their money's worth. And one of the last things I want to leave it at is educate and empower your users. How many people have noticed, this is my 10th year speaking at DEF CON. It's like, I am a broken record. I'm waiting for people to acknowledge it. So finally, I decided after 10 years, I'm just going to up and confess it. I only have one major message. And that your people are your solution, not your liability. Fix them. Stop trying to offset your failings and your misconfigurations and you're not properly teaching your employees onto them and take ownership of it. We need to educate our users. We need to make them understand that they are part of your solution, not part of the problem. Stop trying to create technology to fix your users. Start getting your users on board to protect your technology and everybody succeeds. So that was the rant part I promised. So get right there for a second. I promised Chris I'd be under uh, 50 or he would uh, under punishment of death. And I think he was actually not joking. Uh, so I've got seven more minutes of questions. So we're going to have some really long silence or some questions. Okay, you and then you. Yes. What kind of metrics do I look for when doing a phishing campaign? Or the phishing, or, the phishing, or all the different kinds of like, you know, the phishing, smishing, phishing, all those kind um, that are all end in squishy. But yes, 
uh, I would, one of the key things is, is mostly just the numbers. And one thing that I've seen done in the past and I highly recommend not to is you make sure you never record the name to executives about who actually clicked. It's like the, every person that clicks on their first email test should be re-educated. They said, oh, you clicked on the link. We need to re-educate. You need to go through another class. The second time, I think they should be done through a more stringent class and they should have restricted access. And this is the one that's going to make everybody love me. It's like on the third one, they should be fired or extremely penalized. It's like people keep letting, uh, do you let a delivery driver wreck and total your delivery van more than three times without you thinking you made a, an unwise choice? You know, it's like, I mean, man, Bob, it's like he keeps getting an accident turning left. It's like, should we make him where he just only has to turn right? Or maybe we should get another delivery driver. It's the third car. It's like the cars are like, what, 50 grand? Computers are $300 million, Target. Thank you for telling us what that is. It's like, and, but we're still letting them click the links and go unpunished about it. So there needs to be education, but there needs to be enforcement. Yes, what's your question? Yes, uh, he asked his uh, insurance companies, cyber insurance companies, you know, all the cybers, uh, will actually have policies that give you discounts for doing security awareness for your uh, things. I don't know. Um, I'm not one of those guys who's going to come up here and act like I know all the different answers to all the questions. If I don't know something, I'm going to tell you I don't know. Uh, I know Jake Coons uh, does risk-based uh, security, and he is a way better uh, person that would be able to ask, answer that question. You can check him on uh, Twitter. I think it's the letter J, Coons, K-O-U-N-S, and ask him that. It's like that's a way better source than I am uh, on, on questions like that. Uh, any other questions? No, you just told us you didn't know the answer, Jason. Screw you. It's like, no, here, here goes one. Yes. Ten years. Long. I'm a veteran of the cyber wars. I, I would say yes. It's like, um, he asked, it's like, is it getting better? Is the landscape getting better? Is security getting better? Are, are, is the community going out better? And yes, I think it's actually getting better. Uh, I think we're doing better and reaching out and understanding what the problem is. Uh, it's hard to tell when you go to certain conferences and all you see are blinky boxes. It's like, I mean, oh, look at this blinky box. It's gonna say, we turned the red lights to blue. <sighs> 10,000 times more uh, AI and machine learning in this one protected by the blockchain. It's like, that can be a problem, but understand that I think it's getting better because we're understanding that it's not just technology. I think more people are looking into trying to do social engineering. Uh, I think that another good one is like with the Social Engineering Village doing a conference in February in Orlando. It's like they're trying to help train their users and trying to get people to understand that it's the human element that is your biggest uh, point of failure in your network and how to protect against it. Yes, that was a plug, but you know, I really, Trolled that guy really bad, so I felt bad. Yes. I really liked your uh, Waldo idea. Yes. Yes. It's like when you want to use the carrot instead of the stick. Train. Do lunch and learns. Train your. He asks, like, was there any other way besides uh, the the Waldo? What else could we do to help train our users in a positive way? Do gamification. It's like, but that's part of the gamification one. But I will say this: do lunch and learns. Teach your users how to uh, reconfigure their wireless router online, their, uh, their home router. How to teach them how to change their privacy settings and, and see what their children are doing on Facebook and Instagram, the TikToks and Snapchats and whatever it is out there that everybody's doing that I'm too not cool enough for. Uh, it's like, do those. Show them those lessons and guess what's gonna happen? They're still not gonna care about your data. But they're gonna bring that security consciousness back to work. And they're like, I'm not going to fall for this game at home. I'm not going to do it here either. So teach them how to protect themselves. Teach them how to protect themselves at home where it matters to them. It's like, and they will protect your data when they're at work. I got one minute. Any quick question that I can like overlong and make Chris mad at me after all? Yes. One more. Sorry, Chris. What would I do with people that are purposely doing um, oh, open all the emails because they think they're protected by the uh, thing? I would fire them. 
it's like there was a huge Twitter drama and stuff on that because I was like, oh, how dare you? And I'm like, no. It's like, and policies don't matter. Procedures won't matter if there is not an enforcement. Employees are going to do only what is required for them to keep their job. The reason why they're clicking on so many links is because you're not telling them for them, uh, one of the responsibilities they have to keep their job is to be secure. As soon as you educate them that, that that's one of their job responsibilities, that's one of the things they need to do to stay employed and feed and clothe their children, guess what? They will start taking it seriously. It's like, and until that, you're not going to have it. I'm done. I won't drop the mic. He told me not to. Thank you.